Welcome to this series of lessons called Converting Your Primary Resources. We're talking about the payback for the tithe. I can't tell you how many times over the years I've heard God's people say, I have paid my tithes, but I don't necessarily see that I get the payback. I'm not seeing the money come in. And I think we ought to take a look at that. So I'm going to turn you to the book of Malachi, chapter 3. And I do believe the tithe is eternal, that it predates the law. It started actually in the Garden of Eden when God told Adam not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was really what the tithe is all about. Don't touch my stuff. And that's what God did. Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out or pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, many tithers and givers never fully receive the blessings on their giving. And I would agree with that. There are people who give and, and don't realize all the benefit. And I think there's a reason for it. I think the reason is because they're expecting somehow that it's going to come back to them in money. Now, if you've learned anything about how God's financial system works in this series, you know that God is not in the business of giving money to anybody. God is not a counterfeiter. God has processes that we use to convert money, hence the title of the series, Converting Primary Resources. People are expecting to receive money without them having to do any type of conversion. If you think that way, you will miss a great deal of your blessing. We expect to receive money. That's a false expectation or it's a misbelief because God is not a counterfeiter, but he does have a currency. So if God does have a currency, what is that currency? Well, it's not the U.S. dollar or the uh, the Japanese yen. It's not the euro. It's not the peso. God has a currency, and his currency is wisdom. That's the currency of God. Now, this currency is given to us in more than one channel. Listen to the scripture. I will open you the windows, plural, of heaven. Most people don't think of a window as a channel. It is. A window channels light. You uh, pull back the curtains and let the light shine in. Uh, no doubt that light is channeled through that window. Uh, if you open the window, it can channel out fresh air. Uh, in my case, in this study you sit in, I used to have a problem with the draft on my fireplace, and my window was used to channel out the smoke that <laughs> would develop when I didn't properly set my fire, and then I got some things fixed, and we changed all that. If there was a fire and we had to get out of the house, we would use the windows to channel our bodies. We would do that. I would ask you this, how much money changes hands every year through a drive-up window? And now you can see that windows are most definitely uh, vehicles of commerce. Money changes hands through windows. So when God says, See if I will not open you the windows of heaven. He's talking about commerce, and he's talking about it coming in more than one way. We see that with Abram. Abram was very rich in cattle and in silver and in gold. He had more than one type of flow. God had a number of different ways to get blessing to him. He had cattle. If the cattle market went down, he could sell his silver. If the silver market went down, he had gold. He had all of these. This multifaceted approach is a hedge against downturns because inevitably there will be a downturn of some kind or another. And if your money comes in more than one channel, then you can expect to have a full supply because typically when one thing goes down, another thing doesn't, or it may rise up. And so God uses windows or he uses channels to pour out blessings. 
Uh, one of the pastors that I knew early in my walk with God was a pastor in a small town church. Church paid him a salary, but it wasn't enough for him to take care of his family. He had four children, and um, and and his kids were becoming college age. And in the years before they got to college age, he had a little time each week because the church didn't demand all of his time he was able to take on a second job. He bought an old used flatbed truck and began to haul hay with this flatbed truck. And uh, his boys were old enough that they could stack the hay on the back end, and so he started a hay hauling business. He took the money that he made from hay hauling, and instead of spending it and buying a new car or fancy clothes or whatever, this man was very frugal. Uh, and uh, he would buy old houses, and these old houses were in good enough shape that he could turn around and rent them. I didn't know it at the time. It was only later I found out he had more than a dozen of these rent houses in this town of about 2,500 people, and so that augmented his income. So he had the salary from the church, although it wasn't great, still a salary. He had the money that he made from hauling hay, and then he had the rental income from the properties that he bought. Now, he had different streams of income that were flowing to them. See if I will not open for you the windows of heaven. Now, he got out and hustled and did that. Unfortunately, there are times when people divorce the favor of God from their hustle. You can't say, my own hand has gotten me this wealth. In fact, there's a specific command not to do that. So I want to turn you to where we read it. And it's found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8. And here's what he says. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping His commandments, His judgments, His statutes, which I command you this day. Lest, when you have eaten and are full, and have built beautiful houses, and dwell in them. And when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out from the house of bondage. And then he says later on, in verse 17, And you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. He says, don't think like that. And now, if you didn't have a part to play, there would be no reason for God to tell you not to think like that. It is because you will be involved in your own finances, and you will be involved in the processes that bring you money. It is specifically for this reason that God has to warn you and tell you don't think that you did this all by yourself. You shall remember, very powerful verse, Deuteronomy 8.18, mark it in your Bible. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to your fathers as it is this day. In other words, the whole purpose of your wealth is to advance the covenant of God or the kingdom of God, and that's the reasons God has blessed you. God cannot accomplish His mission to get the gospel to everyone on planet Earth if God's people don't have money. It doesn't cost money to hear the gospel. It does cost money for us to go and preach the gospel. It costs money to put on meetings. And so when we are blessed financially, we're in a position to fund the work of God. This is the reason that the devil wants to provoke the people of God into a knee-jerk reaction against God's legitimate financial system. And there are two extremes in all of this. The two extremes are that you look to money and that you put your trust in money and you make money your aim. That's called the love of money, and Jesus was against it. Then there's the other extreme, and that is to remain in poverty. The Scripture shows us very clearly that God is in neither one of these ditches. You know, a lot of people dwell in the ditches. And uh, I used to think you could travel in the ditches and get to your destination. 
uh, a little slower than the guy who's up on the center of the highway, but that's not true. Uh, you, if you're going to get to your destination, you've eventually got to come out of the ditch or you'll never be able to make it. So the Bible says in Proverbs ten fifteen, the rich man's wealth is his strong city. So that's an extreme. This is a comparison, and it's a comparison of opposites. The rich man's wealth is his strong city, meaning that rich people invariably trust in their money. They've learned that money gets them favor. Money brings them places. They get good things because of their money, and they learn to trust in their money, and they quit trusting in God. Then here's the opposite. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. Now, people also come to a ditch only in the opposite way with this. And the scripture says the destruction of the poor is their poverty, meaning that this is not a blessing. I've heard people say Jesus was poor. No, he wasn't. Jesus didn't carry a million dollars in his personal bank account. But I challenge you to look through the Gospels and find one time where Jesus was without resource. I want you to look carefully. Find one time when Jesus needed financial supply and did not get it. It's just not there. He did not have it in his personal bank account, but when his family needed to go to Egypt to escape the wrath of King Herod, wise men came and brought wealth to Joseph and Mary and of course to baby Jesus, and they were able to live on that in a foreign country for an extended period of time. And they escaped Herod's murderous plot because of that. Uh, Jesus had what he needed. When he needed to pay his temple tax, he told Peter, go fish, and he knew where the fish was, knew what river it was. Uh, Peter went fishing, found the fish. I suppose this is probably in the Sea of Galilee, Then he said, when you find it, open up his mouth. And sure enough, there was a coin in it. Now, (laughs) that is by divine knowledge that he knew where that fish was, and he knew that the hand of God would be on Peter to go out and catch it. When Jesus needed wine to supply for the young couple's wedding at Cana in Galilee, he knew how to get it. He did the same thing on two occasions when he multiplied loaves and fishes. Jesus always had what he needed when he needed it. When he needed a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on the day of the triumphal entry, he didn't have to own the donkey. He didn't own the upper room. He didn't own all the food that was put into it, but he had use of it. That is true prosperity, where that all your needs are met. And by the way, Jesus had wealthy partners, Luke's gospel, the first few verses of chapter 8. There were a number of rich women who gave toward Jesus' ministry and supported him. And he had everything that he needed when he needed it. So I would say to you, the definition of true prosperity is not a million dollars in your bank account or owning everything that you'll ever use. It is having what you need when you need it and never going without. And that's what we know of Jesus. And so he always had a source of supply. When he needed something, it came on time when he needed it. That's the story of his ministry. Now, multifaceted supply. This is something that you need to learn to expect. I uh, was involved in children's ministry and trained children's workers. And at the end of every session that I taught about puppets, people would say, where do you get your puppets? And I would tell them, uh, there's five or six different places you can get puppets from. And I had names and addresses. I had it printed up so that I could give it out because I knew I was going to get hit with it. And instead of reciting it all, I could just hand out these flyers. Well, one day I realized, you know what? I'm the number one salesman for six different puppet companies, and I don't make a dime. And I thought, why can't we have puppets? And I had seen some things that some of the ladies in our church had made for our nursery. And I wondered, can they sew puppets? And so we created some puppet patterns of our own in characters that we would use. And I began to sell them in my meetings. And people would come to me and say, where do you get your puppets? Well, I'm glad you asked. I've got them right here. It wasn't a huge add-on to our ministry, but at the time, it was something a little bit extra to bless us 
when we had to have it. It was another flow, another stream. See, a lot of people think that when you have a stream of income, it needs to be enough to pay all of your bills. What if that stream is enough just to augment it a little bit? What if you've got two or three streams and every little bit helps and you never know when one stream is going to grow and become uh, better than you ever imagined it? So how do you find these streams? Well, I'm glad you asked that question because here's where they come from. This is Isaiah chapter 55. I want you to pay attention to verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now listen to this part. For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower. If you planted a garden lately, how much does it cost you to buy that seed? This is a money-producing commodity. Bread to the eater, how much does a loaf of bread cost today compared to maybe five years ago? So my word shall be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. God says it clears a bell right here. I pay people with thoughts. Ideas are the currency of heaven. And you know why so many people who don't know God get these ideas? It is because the people of God rejected the idea. Pastor friend of mine called together some of the businessmen in his church and said, I want to just ask you a question. You ask them all. Can you think of an idea that God tried to give you that would have made you a lot of money, but you didn't do it? One man spoke up immediately, and all of them did, but this man had a testimony. He said, when I was a young man, he said an older farmer came to me and said, I love the way you work. I've watched what you've done with your farm. I don't have a son. I want my farm to go to somebody like you. Now, I need to sell it, but I don't want to charge you interest. I'm going to let you buy my farm. I'm going to let you pay it out. I'm going to do it in such a way that the farm will pay your payments. In the first few years, it's going to cost you a little bit of money. You're going to have to hire somebody, but I do believe you'll make enough money with my farm. You can pay the hired hand. So this is the way I'd like to set this up. I mean, it was a sweetheart deal. But the man allowed the bigness of it all to frighten him. He wondered about the extra responsibility, and he turned down the offer. So my pastor friend said to him, now that he's older, so what happened? The man was very disappointed when he said, do you know where the mall is today in such and such town? He said, that was the farm. He said, I would have worked that farm for a number of years but long enough to pay the whole thing off. And he said, then I would have been able to sell that to the company that bought the land and built the mall. I would have been the one to make all that money. So you see, God had something for him, but it was an idea. And this idea required work. And so very often we miss the supply that God wants us to have because we're looking for money. Money flows through ideas. I want to thank you for watching our podcast today. And if you really liked it, would you please give us a little thumbs up by clicking on that sign down below? And then I would encourage you to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of our future podcasts because they're all going to be good. And if you would like to support us financially, either with a one-time gift or recurring gift, you can do that by clicking on the link below or going to myfaithroots.com. Thank you so much for watching this program.